granite shores and wooden lands of the north, it's a story of copper mines and iron ore, the Great Lakes fishery. To the farmlands of the southern counties, we'll look around, my friend, and all that waits the sportsmen in the state of Michigan. And sometimes when the moon brings out the diamonds in the snow, and the stillness of the forest lies encased in Arctic cold, the wind might whisper through the trees, listen if you can, it tells you of the beauty in the state of Michigan. Hi there, come on in. Can you feel it in the air? Boy, we have some exciting outdoor activities coming up. Smelt dipping is right around the corner. A brown trout are already being caught in the Great Lakes. We have uh, the trout opener in just a month. But you know, for all this great weather coming up, the deer in some parts of the UP are still having some problems. We have an interesting historical perspective in Michigan's deer herd from the 1850s to the 1950s. We also have a story behind the new grizzly bear that moved into the museum. Taxidermist Roger Smith tells us what went into this mount. Kathy Beitler is serving venison zucchini pizza, so you stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. It's Thursday night. Time for Michigan Outdoors. In the 1950s, the Michigan Department of Conservation published this booklet to distribute to the public to explain the history of deer management in Michigan. It's an excellent overview. Right now, I'd like to turn to the chapter called The Up and Down of Michigan Deer, which starts before the 1850s, a time when Michigan didn't have a lot of deer. As Oz Warbach illustrated, big trees were poor for deer. The leaves and food are up too high. Deer are creature of brushland where food and cover is within a few feet of the ground. The UP in Michigan had a lot of tall trees and consequently very few deer in those days. The northern lower peninsula wasn't much better, but in 1850, lumbermen who had their eyes on cutting lumber from the forests gave the northern deer herds a real boost. By 1870, they had clear-cut pine and spruce and cedar and hemlock and created many openings in the forests and swamps throughout northern Michigan. And in these openings, brush and young trees sprouted up, and the deer herds began building in these areas where the openings were created. But in the late 1800s, when lumbermen began running short on big pines, they began cutting hardwoods which left vast open areas where young growth didn't come up right away. To make matters worse, the loggers left the branches and treetops on the ground where they dried out and often caught fire, burning the clearings. After several fires, the brush and small trees wouldn't grow there, and these areas became large grasslands. Deer don't thrive on grass alone. As if a downturn in their food supply wasn't enough to make life difficult for deer, market hunting was prevalent. Market hunters made money selling deer for meat, and they used dogs, traps, snares, guns, whatever worked to take deer, and they did this year round. The average market hunter could take 10 or 15 deer a day. In 1878, railroad records showed that 70,000 deer carcasses were shipped out of the Lower Peninsula. That was just on railroads. By 1880, 100,000 deer were shipped on railroad cars. Year-round shooting of deer by market hunters, more than anything, wiped deer out of southern lower Michigan by 1885, and Michigan's deer herd was on a downturn. Oz Warbach's graph shows how the deer population was low before 1850, but had a boom due to the logging of pines in the 1850s and 1860s. By 1870, deer were plentiful, but two factors caused this big slide at the end of the century repeated forest fires in the areas that had been logged, and market hunting. And by 1900, Michigan's deer herd was once again at an all-time low. But you can see there's a gradual rise in the years ahead, one that continues into the 1950s, and this was the result of a deliberate effort to put an end to the problems that deer were facing. First of all, forest fire control came into being, and the effects were dramatic. In the late 1800s, fires were burning 2 million acres a year in Michigan. By 1920, fires were down to a little over 200,000 acres a year. That was cut in half by 1930, and cut again by three-fourths in the 1940s. By the 1950s, forest fires consumed only 5,000 acres a year. 
The result of forest fire control in the early 1900s was that seedlings began growing in the openings. Brushlands sprouted up everywhere, and the entire northern part of Michigan was becoming one big deer thicket. During the same era, deer hunting regulations were instituted starting in 1859. The first deer season limited deer hunting from what had been a year-round activity to August 1st through the end of the year. That was a five-month season. And keep in mind that market hunting was still legal, so deer didn't find much protection from the hunting season. In 1873, the season was shortened, October 1st through the end of the year. 1881 saw some real protective measures come in. Deer could only be killed for food, they couldn't be shipped out of state, trapping deer was made illegal, and so was taking deer in water, and deer couldn't be taken if they had spots. In other words, fawns were protected, and this all came about in 1881. In 1883, the season was shortened again to the month of November. 1887, dogs were outlawed for deer hunting, and so was taking deer with artificial lights. And for the first time, an entire county was closed to deer hunting. That was Allegan County in 1891. Four years later, the first bag limit was set on deer, five deer for a season. But the biggest help to deer came in 1901 when the limit was not only reduced to three deer, but market hunting, the taking of deer professionally and selling the meat was outlawed. That helped the deer herd rebound for recreational hunters. Regulations tightened deer hunting even more in the next few years. The season limit was reduced to two deer in 1905, one deer in 1915, and in 1921, the limit was one buck with antlers at least three inches long. Then in 1925, the deer season was shortened to November 15th to the 30th, where it stands today for firearm deer hunting. There was also a pattern of periodic closures on deer hunting in the early 1900s. Various parts of the state on a county-by-county -county basis were closed until 1948 when deer hunting was once again allowed statewide, but it was bucks only. But a new trend began causing problems for deer. The era of lumbering was over and trees began growing taller over larger areas. In the winters of the 1930s and 1940s, deer began running short on food. Deer starvation losses became a regular part of Michigan winters. The winter of 1950-51, oh, that was a humdinger. Deep snow fell in the November deer season. By Christmas, temperatures were below zero. By February, northern Michigan saw the thermometer drop to 40 below. Two to three feet of snow covered the ground in early April of 1951. By the end of April, 50,000 deer were dead from starvation alone. That was a phenomenal number considering the size of the deer herd in those days. That's when game biologists realized that deer had to be controlled to match their food supply. Doe hunting was introduced, a practice that hadn't been legal since 1920. Now that change in what had become a bucks-only tradition in Michigan caused quite a furor among hunters in the 1950s. Would doe hunting ruin deer hunting? Or would removing a certain number of does actually keep the herd healthy? Well, game biologists were certain they were right, and they were. But to this day, some hunters still have trouble believing it. The history of Michigan's deer herd proves that Balancing animals with their food supply is the key to keeping our game populations healthy. We'll continue our story of the history of Michigan's deer herd, those controversial 1950s on a future show. But if you'd like to read those chapters that we just covered on this program, get a hold of the February-March issue of the Outdoor Digest magazine and the hunters who were lucky enough to draw a permit. You know, I've thought that over the years that women have become more involved in turkey hunting. Well, I ran a computer check on this, published it in our uh, April-May issue of the Digest, and I was surprised. It has remained relatively constant since 1985. Between 4 and 5 percent of the trophy turkey hunters have been women, but it's held right at that over the years. Now, one of those lucky ladies was April Dunlop, whose photo starts off our trophy book. 
She was only 14 years old when she first went turkey hunting in Benzie County using a 16 gauge pump. She got this 20 pound gobbler with a nine inch beard. April Dunlop's dad is a taxidermist in Lake Ann, so I imagine that trophy is proudly mounted by now. Here's a bluegill worth mounting, one and a half pounds, 11 and 5 eighths inches long. Ben Costin from Rothschild, Wisconsin, caught it from Iron County's Lake Mary. Some nice bluegill come from the UP. And look at this odd catch, a three and a half pound gizzard shad caught by Dennis Kish from Port Huron. He caught it in the St. Clair River mid-April. Very unusual. And for a great story, listen to Mike Berman from Portage, who learned that turkey calling isn't as complicated as he thought. My buddy and I, Jeff, went down to Missouri hunting turkeys, and uh, he shot his a couple days before I was able to get down there. I got down there, and we hunted three days straight. On the last day I had to hunt, uh, he called in a bird for an hour and a half and finally came in. It was a 26-pounder with a 10 and a half inch beard. Man, that, that's, that's a Missouri bird. Yeah. Now, you've always had kind of a complex about your calling ability. Yeah. Like, he's better than you? <laughs> he's a whole lot better than I am. <laughs> okay, but the story's not over yet. You came back to Michigan, got a turkey permit. Yeah. Uh, it was the first day of our season to hunt, and he decided he was going to fish a bass tournament. So I was going to have to call by myself. And I was real skeptical. Uh, went out there, got in the woods, got set up to where we scouted, and I heard him gobbling way off on this knoll out in the middle of a swamp. So I headed out that way, and I set up, and I tried calling, but it wasn't working. They were gobbling. They wouldn't move. Yeah, but your buddy had that same problem. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't come right in for him in Missouri. <laughs> well, I didn't have that patience after about 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, it sounded like they were moving away from me, so I started up the knoll. And I knew once they went down the other side, they went across the creek, and I'd never have a chance. I got just about to the top and given up all hope, and all of a sudden they gobbled, all three of them, right there. They were, <laughs> I could just, you know, see them right in front of me. They were I hot. I ducked my head right back down, clicked my safety off, put the gun to my shoulder, and just raised up, and I saw one of them about fifth second before he saw me, and wow. let him have it. He learned he could call turkeys on his own in St. Joseph County. That's a nice trophy book picture of Mike Berman, our Michigan Outdoors Trophy Turkey Hunter of the Week. On Saturday at our Michigan Outdoors Museum in Bath, taxidermist Tim Hayes is going to be mounting several fish, starting with a 26-inch Great Lakes brown trout. Then he'll skin and mount a 20-inch inland brown. And late in the afternoon, he's going to do a 20-inch largemouth bass, a chance to see how professional fish taxidermy is done. On Sunday, artist Dave Bowman will be available to do remarks on the loon prints that public TV contributors bring in. He charges a nominal fee for this, and he'll be setting up a new diorama in the museum, which he's been working on. What I'm going to do is I'm going to actually add a base to the painting, and I'm going to have cattails actually coming up three-dimensional, oh. and then I'm going to have mounted birds coming off of the painting, so it's going to have a three-dimensional like, feel like to it. Like that mounted right there. Exactly. That These, is really a nice, a nice mount of a... Thanks. Th th yeah, I mean, that these, fits right in with yeah, its wings set. These two paintings actually connect as one unit, and then um, the mounted mallards will be, you know, a real integral part of the painting. You ought to come finished, up and, so. and do this at the museum where we can follow building it. Yeah, yeah, that's be true. Be a big attraction. That I think people fun. would love to see how you're going to combine taxidermy and flat art and... Mm -hmm. The diorama. And, the, yeah. The, it's like a museum piece, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, literally, this is what's done in... in museums, you know, where they mm -hmm. actually paint the backdrops and that. So I've just taken it a little bit farther, I think, this way. Dave Bowman will begin setting up his three-dimensional mural on Sunday afternoon. Our museum hours are 10 to 5. Grizzly bears in Alaska. Not many people get to see him up close, but Roger Smith from Leslie said we'd be welcome to pick up a small standing grizzly that he mounted several years ago and put it in our museum. Bears, for their size, Raj, do have beady little eyes, don't they? Yeah. I mean, they, they must be some of the smallest eyes that you get in the taxidermy business, aren't they? Yeah, this, a bear this size has a, the same size eyes as a 15-pound raccoon. Is that right? Yeah, see, bears depend more on their nose and uh, their ears. These fuzzy little ears. Yeah. Now, this is a Alaskan grizzly that yes. you got? Yes, yeah, interior grizzly. How much would this weigh? Uh, I'm going to guess about... Uh, about 300 pounds live weight. Mm -hmm. Now this mount 
you knew you were going to make before you got the bear. Oh, yeah. Right? I, I had the pose picked out before I even stepped on the plane. <laughs> no kidding. Well, these we have pictures here of you with the bear. You can see that hump right on the bear's yeah. shoulder. Always a pronounced attribute of, of grizzly bears. What are you doing there? Uh, this is, after we shot the bear, we put uh, mustache wax on the, on the hair to, uh, so the plaster cast would not uh, stick to the hair. And then here we're putting uh, plaster bandage, the same thing as used for cast, uh, mm. on the face to make a, a mold of the face. And then once I get this taken back home, uh, then we make a, uh, a d what we call a death mask from that to use as reference for, for the sculpturing and the moaning. But, but that, that's for the face. Why is the face so important? Why, why was this? In fact, we have that mask right here that you did. This is what you what you made off of that. Right. Yeah, that's, that's uh, in a bear, especially with the long hair, that's where all the detail is, and that's where everybody looks, is at the nose, the eyes, and the lips. Hmm. So you felt, as a, as a taxidermist, that this was the most important thing you can do on location. Yeah. And brought, brought this back to sculpt, to sculpt this from. Right. Now, this... What in the world? Yeah, this is, I also brought back, uh, once we skinned the animal, we measured it, uh, and we boned it out. We brought back the skeleton, the entire skeleton, uh, set it up in the pose we wanted, and then uh, started applying the clay. It's an oil-based hmm. modeling clay, and you can uh, just model it up to the, to the size and shape and pose you want. And that's all done. How did you know, I mean, you can't just eyeball that. Look at those skinny little arms. Right. That, uh, basically, that this this bear has. Where did you? Uh, where? Yeah, this is this sheet shows the uh, all the measurements uh, of certain points. And these are all in millimeters. Either the, there's a thickness measurement and uh, uh, you know the the width and thickness of each leg. Looks like an architect's drawing of <laughs> some <laughs> project. You made these right up there. Yeah. After you skinned the bear, before. After, the the face measurements are taken over the skin. Mm -hmm. And then the uh, the rest of the measurements are taken over the meat. Hmm. Put all that together, came up with this form. But this form, let's see, you have here. Yeah. What is this? This is a plaster. Yeah. This is well, this death mask and the measurements that we were in the pictures. We refer to them as reference, and this is also as a piece of reference. This isn't from from this bear, but it's a cast of a black bear. And, and that's it, you actually put the muscle. Yeah. Groups in there. Right. But we use this as reference uh, to show what shape that that arm would be in. And, uh, That's from your sculpture, right? Then, on top of the sculpture, you you, you make a, a mold on the outside of that, right? What we do is after the you get the clay model like we want, we make a fiberglass mold. Uh, depending on the position, it could mm -hmm. be anywhere from five pieces to twenty-five pieces. And then once the uh, the mold is taken off, uh, you wax it, and then you pour uh, urethane foam inside. So then you have a lightweight. Exactly. This is from one of the deer that you sculpted. Right. Yeah, this, where this clay where it weighs maybe 300 pounds, mm -hmm. it may only take 20 pounds worth of foam to produce a mannequin. So that's what's in this bear right here. Right. This, this foam. Mm -hmm. And the hide, is that glued onto the right. mannequin? The, the skin is tanned, and then uh, when it's wet, it's, it's glued right onto the mannequin and sewed on. Hmm. Uh, so this is... Of course, you tan this hide yourself. You're in the tanning business now for taxidermists. Correct. Boy, the claws on this baby. So this is as anatomically correct for a bear as you could possibly make it. Right. Yeah, it's, and the form is made to fit this bear. This grizzly is now on display at our museum, thanks to Roger Smith, and we're building an exhibit that will show how it was originally mounted. Walleye like this will, will be caught in Lake Erie, Detroit River, in just a few weeks. But there's some anglers, Charlie Keenan, who have called us, who aren't going to be able to fish the Great Lakes or Connecting Waters because they didn't buy this $25, well, depending on the size of the boat, $25, $50 sticker from the federal government to put on their boat, which they must have, right, for Great Lakes and Connecting well, Waters? Well, they'll be able to fish, but there'll be a delay they may, may miss the beginning of the season because of the time it takes to get the sticker back from the federal government. So this isn't something you can go to the post office and buy or anything like that? No, you have to order it. You can either order it by mail. They have a hotline, but best case scenario is two weeks on the hotline. Size of the boat makes the difference on the fee. That's right. I'm not even going to get into what this money goes for because this has been hotly contested. Why do we have to have another boat tax? 
So I'm not going to not going to okay. do that, right? <laughs> But this is a fact that right now for this year, everybody's going to have to buy that who wants to fish or boat in Great Lakes or Connecting Waters. What does the future look for this? I know Representative Bob Davis from Gaylord has, has introduced federal legislation to repeal this. That's right. He has uh, the, the bill in right now. But even if it goes through, that sticker is needed for this year. If it's repealed, it'll be next summer before any... Uh, a and relief you, takes effect. And the relief will start on the smaller boats first. That's right, and work its way on up to the bigger boats, which hopefully be 94 and 95 before that's off. So, if you don't have that sticker, you want to fish in Great Lakes or Connecting Waters, you must order it, and it's going to take two to three weeks to get it. That's the bad news. The good news is we have a great recipe from Kathy Beitler right now. We've got a delicious pizza recipe called Venison Zucchini Crescent Pizza. And it's got all your regular pizza ingredients, except the crust is different. Now, when we first started doing this, I thought that this would never, ever make out into a crust to fill all the little cracks. But you keep working it and working it, and it really does. That's just that crescent roll stuff, Right, huh? exactly, in the little tube. And then uh, pizza sauce is just straight paste right out of the can, and you just spread that really thin. Tomato paste. Yep, and then your veggies. And you got red peppers, green peppers, onion, well, and now, mushroom. You said this was normal, but you're stir frying the the vegetables. Just first. a little bit first, just to warm them up. Mm. Yep. And then you got your venison burger, and then the sauce is just egg and mozzarella cheese that's shredded, and parsley flakes and Parmesan cheese, and a little bit of Italian seasoning. Mixing that egg in with it. Now yep. That, that just kind of holds everything together. And it really does give it just a little bit of extra oomph. Huh. And I thought it was great. And then just add a few mushrooms and your green peppers on top and then just pop it into the oven. Well, let's try this on a resident pizza connoisseur. Well, I'll tell you what, I've had pizza in Chicago. I've had pizza everywhere in this state. I make my own pizza and this is fantastic. Well, I agree with you. I've had pizza all over. I love Chicago pizza. Mm -hmm. I make the best pizza going, I thought, <laughs> yes. until this. And I'll tell you what, Kathy, do, do you want another piece? I was looking, I, yes. <laughs> What's going to happen to you? I'll split it what, with you. What is the deal on this crust? It's like a pie crust. Right, it's just the crescent rolls and just really, really thin. Crescent rolls and mm -hmm. the venison. Let me oh. tell you, there's lots of it on here. You can't even taste that it's, it's venison. so I mean, mild. I wish I could almost taste a little venison. Mm -hmm. but I've spent hours working on crust that isn't half this good. I know it. <laughs> this is awesome. You know, the only thing that's missing is a little zucchini. <laughs> it is missing. Yes, it is. You left out a prime ingredient yes, in this recipe. Why? I uh, just forgot it. Just, just forgot plain it? Plain forgot it. A that's key right. ingredient, and I'll tell you what's left, is phenomenal. I can't imagine that zucchini would make it any better. It may give it a little more bulk. Right, a little bit. But that's yep. it. Oh, man. Well, look what we did with the plate. <laughs> There's a testimonial right there. Very, very good. It's done by the time we got around to taping this. Mm -hmm. Wow. You bet that pizza is outstanding. We all love <music> Next week on Michigan Outdoors, we'll show why hunters are so fanatic about spring turkey hunting and what they're doing to prepare for this special season. And a report on the DNR's response to a sportsman's club that offered the DNR money for two fish and game projects and were turned down both times. That's next week, right here on Public TV.